Call up the raw file, just double click on the CR2, and play around with the white balance, the exposure, make it look the way you want it to look. And if you really mess it up, I mean, play around with the sliders, give them good cranks around. If you mess it up and you want to go back to the original version of the image, you can click on this little hamburger button, this little icon over here to the right of the word basic, and go back to camera raw defaults, and that'll set it back to the way it was when it came out of the camera. So make it look the way you want, and then I'll show you how to process the image into something that's usable. And don't feel like you need to make it look like the person's next to you. There's no real right answers here. Um, when it comes to art, you're the one calling the shots. If you want this to have a bit of a cool sort of tone, uh, maybe she's feeling isolated or lonely, maybe uh, you can give it a bit of a cooler tone. If you want to give it a bit of a warmer tone, a more romantic sort of feel, that's fine. When I was in college, one of the uh, professors we had, he did a process called dye transfer printing. It was a really complex process that made really amazing prints. And he had a friend who was also doing dye transfers, and his friend decided one day that he was just going to properly color balance all of his images. So he bought a color meter that measures the color of the light and put filters on his lens and perfectly balanced all of his images. And he said when he did that, his images lost their soul. They lost a bit of uh, what it was that made the image. Like if you take a portrait in the evening as the sun's going down, you've got that beautiful golden light coming in. If you perfectly white balance that light, is that gonna give the same feeling as what was actually happening in that moment? No, you're gonna kind of neutralize it, it'll look normal toned, but you don't get that golden feel to it. So by playing around with these options here, you can give a different feel to the image. And when you're ready, you'll notice at the bottom of the uh, window here, there's actually four buttons. We've got done, cancel, open image, and save image. One of the things about the RAW format is you can't change it. Um, when you save a RAW file, that's what it's gonna be. So if I made some changes here, let's say I played around with the white balance and the exposure and stuff, and I opened up the image, if I wanted to go back to that RAW file and process it again, how do you think it would keep those changes? Where would it record those changes? Anybody know? Well, give this a try. Hit done, and then look in the folder where you got that RAW file from. You'll notice something has appeared just below your RAW file. It has the exact same name, except instead of CR2, it ends with XMP. And it's a tiny little file, mine is seven kilobytes, and if you look at it, it's just a big honkin' text file, and it's a recording of all the different settings that were in Camera Raw when you processed out that file. So it just shows you what was in there. And if you wanted to process the image again, uh, we'll just watch on the screen for a second. Take a look at this. If I open up this RAW file, you'll notice that this XMP was created at 8.52 a.m. Sure enough, at 8.52, that's when I created it. I'll open up this RAW file again, and I'll do something really silly with it, just for the heck of it. And then I'll hit Done. The RAW file is updated. Of course, it still says 8.52, because it's still 8.52. Let me do it now. There we go. Hit Done. And the XMP was updated at 8.53. And if I open the RAW file, well, there's all those silly changes that I made. But look at this. If I take this XMP file and I move it just out onto my desktop there, and I open the RAW file, it looks exactly the way it was when it was first created. So it's that XMP that's remembering where those sliders were. If I put it back, there's all those silly changes. Whenever you're working in RAW, if you open a RAW file, the first thing Camera Raw does is says, OK, is there an XMP in this folder with the exact same name? And if there is, it uses the data that's in there. So that's how this information is stored, which has some interesting implications. Let's say you're doing a job with a, a wedding photographer. And at the end of the day, he says, you know what? I'm exhausted. Take the hard drive of images and do all the color corrections, white balance, all that kind of stuff, play with the contrast. And then give me the RAW files back tomorrow because I want to process out some web galleries or uh, you know, some little proof sheets for the bride and groom to take a look at. So you go home, you do all the white balance adjustments and stuff, and let's say he gives you like you know, a thousand raw files. And at the end of the day, you take all those raw files and you send them back to him, and he opens them up, what's he gonna see? If all you give him is those raw files back, he's gonna see exactly what he gave you, the unfinished or the uncolor balanced images. And he's going to be quite upset, possibly not pay you. So in that case, you would have to give him back 2,000 files, the 1,000 raw files and 1,000 little XMPs, and that would have the changes that you made in Camera Raw. Just be careful though, because there are some differences in the way different processing programs handle this situation. If he's using Lightroom, it'll see the XMPs. If he's using Camera Raw, it'll see the XMPs. If he's using Capture One, which is looking for a session file or a database file, it isn't gonna see those changes. So you'll send him back the RAW files and the XMPs. You're like, here's your 2,000 files, the RAW files and the XMPs. He'll call up Capture One, it'll look and see the RAW files, it'll totally ignore the XMPs. So be careful with RAW files. In a way, it's like the negative. Back in the days of film, the photographer would take a photograph, he would have the negative, and he would make a print from the negative and give the client the print. 
but the negative stays with the photographer. A raw file is kind of like that. It's like your negative, so you don't send that out. And in this case, there's 20 raw files in here, and to open them all up and save them, it would be a bit of a pain, wouldn't it? Instead of doing them one at a time, I'm gonna show you how to do all 20 at once, and then process them all at the same time. So go into the folder called Process These, select any of the images, and then do Command A, and that'll select all the files that are in that folder. And then double click any of them. So they'll all open up in Photoshop. Down the left side there, you can see we have this new film strip mode that we didn't have before. And if you scroll up and down, you'll see all the different images that are in here. So it'll take about five minutes, go through the images, adjust the white balance, the exposure, make them look the way you want. And again, everyone's is gonna be different. And if you want to see a comparison of how it looked before you started, at the bottom of the window here, the preview, you see this little icon with the Y in it. If you click on that, it'll cycle through the different ways of seeing the before and after. So in this mode, I see the before on the left, the after on the right. Here it does a little split screen. Here they're stacked above each other. Here it's split vertically. And then it takes it back to just the after view. So all the changes that you're making are going to be saved as XMPs. And you can tell if you've made any changes to an image because you'll see this little circle icon just to the bottom right of it over there. If it doesn't have an icon, you know that you haven't made any changes. It's still at its camera raw defaults. Okay, so let's take a look at processing all of these images out. We can only have one visible at a time in the window over here, but we can have multiple images selected. If you hold down the Shift key, you can add to the selected images. Or from this little pop-up up here, we could choose Select All, or Command A will automatically select all the images. And once you select them all, you'll notice something changed down at the bottom. We've got these four little buttons, Done, Cancel, Open Image, and Save Image. But once you selected all of them, or anything more than one, you'll notice that the Open button changed to Open Images, plural, and the Save Image turned to Save Images, also plural. If we clicked done. The window would close, no files would get processed, but XMP files would be created so we wouldn't lose any of the changes. If we hit cancel, this window would close, no XMPs would be created, and we would lose all the changes that we made. If we hit open images, here's the thing. With 20 images selected, it would process 20 images and it would open them all up in Photoshop, ready for you to do some editing on them. 20 images is an awful lot to have open at one time. Your computer only has so much RAM in it, probably 16 gigabytes if you're on one of the iMacs, probably eight or 16 if you're on a laptop. And when that RAM gets full, you'll notice your machine will slow down quite a lot. Has anybody ever worked in Photoshop and suddenly things just really seem to slow down, it takes a long time for files to open? You've run out of RAM. And what it's doing is it's going to the hard drive using what's called a scratch disk. So it'll make a little virtual partition on that drive, it's called virtual RAM. And the RAM is kind of what your computer's thinking about any one time. And it's fast, crazy fast. So when you got something open in Photoshop, you can run files on it, you can run filters, you can open close. But when it gets full, it goes to the hard drive and that slows things down a whole lot. So rather than opening all 20 files, and, and maybe you shot a wedding and there's like a thousand images in there, try to open a thousand, your computer would just, it would explode. It would catch fire and that would be the end of it. So that's where this one over here comes in. We're gonna use the Save Images button to save all these images at once. Okay, so once you're happy with your changes, go into that little pop-up at the top right there and choose Select All, or Command A, we'll get all those images selected, and click the Save Images button. And it's gonna ask you some questions. First, it's gonna ask you, well, where do you want these things to go? By default, it'll try to save it in the same location, so we would end up with 60 files in that folder. We'd have 30 RAW files, 30 XMPs, and 30 whatever we create from here. Um, we don't wanna put it there. That folder that you created, the last name, first name, click on, the, click on the Select Folder button, navigate to wherever you put that folder, I put mine on the desktop, and hit Select. You could also have created the folder from within that window just with the new folder button. Now, as far as the file naming goes, by default, it'll just call it whatever the raw file was called. You could rename them, but I wouldn't suggest it. Here's the thing, your raw files have a certain name to them. So let's say you shot a wedding and all of your files were named like these ones are, you know, IMG0086, and there were a thousand files all the way up to IMG, you know, 3,492. And you're like, wait, that's not a thousand files. Of course, you'll have edited out all the ones that are out of focus and all the ones that you didn't like. So you've got all these different IMG numbers in here. If you change the name here while you're processing them out, and you've got a whole bunch of options, you could add something to the document name, you could add a different serial number. What you've processed out isn't gonna match up with your raw files. So if the client says, oh, I love this, let's say it was uh, Betty and Dave's wedding. So instead of the document name, you say, well, let's put in some text here, and we'll call it 
Betty and Dave. And ooh, here's a fun thing that we'll do. Let's put on a four digit number and we'll start it at uh, 4824. You think, why would we start at 4824? Well, here's the thing. Let's say you shot that wedding and you took 3,000 photographs, which is not that unusual these days. With digital cameras, people get a little shutter happy. And then you edit out 2,000 of them. So you've only got 1,000 images that you send to the clients. If they look at it and go, wait, this starts at 0086 and goes up to you know 3742, which means you took 3,000 photographs at our wedding, but there's only 1,000 images here. They'll get a little suspicious. They say, where's the rest of the pictures? And they'll want them. Of course, those are the ones that were out of focus, bad composition, people's eyes were closed. You don't want them to see those. So by doing a rename, you could close up all the gaps. If you started at 4824, they won't suspect. If you started at 0001, they'll be like, really? You started your camera at one? But if you do it here and they say, oh, we want the uh, Betty and Dave, gives a sample of what the name's going to come out like, uh, Betty and Dave 4824.jpg. We love that one. And you're like, cool, I'll just go to the raw files. And, oh, uh, well, you have nothing that matches up with that name. And you'll sit, you'll go into the folder, you'll be looking at the, their select, you'll be looking at the raw files and comparing, okay, well, our hand's in this position here, and it's a real pain in the butt. So you wanna make sure that these have the same name. So this is not the place to be renaming them. Uh, you can do a batch rename of the raw files, but that's a little bit beyond what we're doing today. So I'm not gonna do anything here. We're simply gonna leave it at the original document name. So it defaults to the document name. Now the file extension, you've got a bunch of options for saving this thing up and changing the extension will also change the format. So if you change it here or here, it doesn't matter. But if you wanted to save them as uh, low res JPEGs, you know, that they can take a look at really quick, there's your JPEG. There's also a capitalized version of it. Don't worry about that. Some of the older computer systems require capitalization. Uh, so if you knew they were gonna be looking at it on like an old Windows system or something, you could force it to a capital JPG. But other than that, it doesn't really matter. TIFF and PSD, they're good formats. Uh, PSD, if you're going to be doing some retouching, some Photoshop work on it, you can throw on your layers, adjustment layers and stuff. If it's for publication, if it's like you want the absolute highest quality possible and file size isn't an issue, you can save it up as a TIFF file. But JPEG, it's a good compromise between file size and quality. DNG is something else altogether. We won't even get into DNG, but let's leave it as JPEG for now. And down here, you'll notice that there's some options for, first off, the amount of compression that gets applied. So we could say, well, let's keep it, uh, well, we don't want the files to be too large. So let's hit it with a quality of eight. And the metadata, it's all the information that, first off, the camera created. Whenever you take a photograph, the camera records its model number, its serial number is recorded right into the files. If you're taking pictures with your phone, your location data is in there. So if somebody has a picture that's taken from your phone, they can get the lo exact location you took that picture. The shutter speed, ISO, the aperture, all the, all the information that your camera created. So you can tell it, well, you know what? I don't want people to know where this photo was taken. Maybe it's a wedding photo and it's this like you know uh, beautiful waterfall in the forest forest and uh, you don't want people to be able to find that, you can tell it, well, you know what, you know, we're just putting in the copyright and contact or everything except the camera raw. Maybe your, your shutter speed and aperture combination gave that beautiful out of focus background. You can say, well, you know what, everything except that. I don't want people to know what my settings were. So usually you do like, you know, copyright and contact info only because, you know, people don't need to know all that other stuff. Uh, you can also click the remove location info. Uh, color space. Uh, sRGB is kind of the standard space for cell phones and stuff, but Adobe RGB is a bit of a better color space. So let's click it over to Adobe RGB. And for the depth, you really only have the 8 bits per channel option because we're saving it to JPEG. But if you've been doing TIFF or PSD, you would have the 16 bits. And the image sizing. Right now, it's gonna process it out at, oh, mine is set to scale it down a bit. Normally, you would just leave it at default. So whatever size your camera was capable of, if you had a 22 megapixel camera, you'll get 22 million pixels in each image. But let's say you were doing some low res um, files. We're gonna do it at the default size, so don't, turn, don't do the resize here. Don't worry about anything in here, and don't worry about the sharpening either. Once you've got all that set, the destination, the format, the compression, um, hit save and watch what happens. So you've told it to go into your folder, that last name, first name, week six. And at the bottom of the window there, the bottom of the camera raw window, you'll see a little countdown in the corner, 11 remaining, nine remaining, eight. So depending on the speed of your computer, it'll either go faster or slower. Yep. What happens if you try to make an adjustment while it's saving? Uh, well, you could. It wouldn't get saved in the file that came out, but if you then processed it again, it would. And then when you hit done, uh, it would record that in the XMP. So you would lose the old XMP, uh, but, it would, but it would keep the changes. But it just wouldn't end up in the files that were saved. So I mean, if you had like a thousand images in there, 
it might take a, an hour or so, but it would process them all out. And these days, the machines are pretty fast. But I remember when raw files used to take, it, was, it wasn't in the seconds per file, it was in the minutes per file. Um, doing a web gallery of like, you know, 50 or 60 images, literally you would leave it overnight. You'd come back in the morning and it would be done. So machines are quite fast these days. Appreciate what you have. I also remember back when I was doing the um, uh, graphics for the Gemini Awards back in 1995, uh, the video, and at that time it was standard resolution video, so it was 640 pixels wide, not like, you know, 4,000 pixels wide like we have nowadays, or 1080. When you're doing video, just rendering out a 30 second little spot would take about an hour or two hours just for it to do every single frame in the video. Nowadays, of course, these machines, you can do video editing in real time, so it's amazing how far things have come. All right, once you've got them processed out, once that countdown has finished, you can hit done. And if you look in the folder where the raw files were, you will see those 20 XMPs. And again, don't worry about the, oh, you know what? <laughs> I didn't change the destination for mine. <laughs> so I put it all into my folder. Ideally, yours would have gone into your last name, first name, week six folder. And had I set things properly, you know what? I'm going to, ah, screw it.